Hello and welcome to the Sales Lab from Homebridge Financial, where we discuss the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's housing market. Our program is designed to share the best practices and market intelligence with builders and new home sales professionals so you can find success regardless of market conditions. Our host is Anthony Grast, National Sales Director for Homebridge Financial's Builder Division, who will lead in today's conversation. Subscribe to this podcast to bookmark this link so you can find your way back for future episodes. And now our host, Anthony. Hello, and welcome to the Sales Lab from Homebridge Financial, where we discuss the best sales ideas, strategies, and solutions for today's housing market. My name is Anthony Grost, and I'm host of today's program. Today's topic is all about our hot housing market, and are we reaching a tipping point around affordability? Are we at risk of a slowdown or a change in the market? As all of you are aware, prices have rapidly appreciated the last 12 months, and they've appreciated along with rising mortgage rates. That combination negatively affects affordability or house purchasing power. In addition today, uh, the largest buyer cohort for new homes are millennials, those under 40. They account for about 45% of the market. What we know about millennials, though, is they have good credit, they have good jobs, but they are low down and they are highly dependent on financing with over 95% of them using financing to purchase a home. So if prices continue to rise and rates go up, affordability will become an issue in the market. But when and what are the risks that we're going to face um, moving forward? To help us answer some of these questions today, I've invited Jeff Tucker to be on our program. Jeff is a senior economist with Zillow and also a noted author and writer on many articles about housing. So Jeff, welcome to our program today. Thanks for having me on, Anthony. It's good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We've had you on before and you always give great insight and ideas about what's going on in the market. But I want to just start with some basics. I mean, why is this housing market so hot? What are the factors driving demand today? You, you already touched on the demographics, but just to kind of dig into it a bit, there are so many millennial home buyers right now because there are so many people in that critical kind of tipping point age range. This, mm -hmm. this window of 25 to 34 has so many people in it. It's got about 5 million more people than it did 10 years ago, or that's about 46 million people today versus 41 million people 10 years ago. This is kind of the crest of the wave of people kind of born right around 1990. Uh, that, that's the most populous birth year right now. And then kind of on either side of it, uh, you have another several million extra people. Now that generation is still majority renters, that, that age range is majority renter because 34 is kind of the tipping point that we seem to find in surveys of first time home buyers. They were mostly renting and then the pandemic struck and a whole lot of those people who were thinking, I'm gonna buy my first home, you know, sometime in the next two or three years, I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna outgrow my space soon. Um, you know, one, maybe once I have a dog, maybe once I have kids, um, et cetera, they got tipped from that tipping point. The pandemic tipped them right into wanting to buy now. They needed a home office. They got a pandemic puppy. Uh, maybe their kids are growing bigger. Uh, suddenly, we all needed more space at home. We needed more outdoor space at home. So a lot of, you know, sometime in the next few years became, I need to do this now. That was also spurred on by record low mortgage rates. It was also spurred on by a lot of the amenities that came with, you know, urban condos or urban apartments mm -hmm. getting shut down. Those rooftop decks all got closed. The media rooms, the, you know, the cafe down the block, everything got closed. The office that had the great, you know, wraparound monitor to do your work got closed. You had to do it in your kitchen now if you were in, in a studio apartment. So a whole lot of pull reasons, pulling people toward mm -hmm you know, the, the types of home that, homes that tend to be purchased and a lot of pushes to get out of the types of homes that tend to be rented this year, plus those mortgage rates. So that really tipped this huge generation into buying homes and we hadn't really built enough to get ready for it. They're coming into a market where builders were kind of just finally firing on all cylinders in 2019 and coming into 2020. You know, that winter on the eve of the pandemic, we finally had like three good months in a row of building starts and, and permits and everything. Uh, but 
it takes a long time to build enough homes for millions of people. And that was coming after 12 or 13 years of underbuilding. So it was kind of this perfect storm of not enough supply and this big wave of demand suddenly came rushing in the doors to buy homes all at once. Yeah, it's it's definitely been eye opening, you know, to see this this level of demand, and we see it on our side as well. You mentioned about thirty four being the tipping point. If I look in our data, um, I can see in the millennial, which represents about forty five percent of all new home buyers in our data, average age is right around thirty three and a half. So, you know, great comment on the thirty four years, you know, really being that that prime home buying age. But while we're on inventory, I mean, it's obvious we are out of inventory. But one of my one of my questions is why so low? Because you know when COVID hit, when we were in the pandemic, I understood people not listing and selling their home because of the economic unknown, the pandemic unknown. But now we're recovering and we're recovering well. Uh, we have vaccines; things are progressing forward. We have a hot housing market. You know why hasn't inventory picked up? Why hasn't there been more people listing? I mean, is 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 that actually happening or not happening? Because I've, I've just wondered why we haven't seen the, the uh, listings come on for resale out there. Right, so uh, to, I, I think to disentangle what happened to the inventory level, we need to distinguish between sort of, I, I think of inventory like a bathtub. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, the current active listings, that's the level of the bathtub. New listings, like you said, you know, homeowners putting their home on the market, that's how open the tap is going into the bathtub. The, the drain would be sales. Um, I guess, you know, people clearly delist their homes, but we'll think mostly about sales, especially in a market like this. Uh, most people who list are gonna sell their home. Um, so the, the pro what has happened really since maybe June, 2020, is that the drain on the bathtub was open wide. We are selling 15, 20% more homes every single month, week after week. Um, bathtub was draining fast. The, the tap wasn't turned off. It, it, it wasn't really that we had an extraordinarily low flow of new listings hitting the market. It was sort of similar to 2019 in a lot of months or just a little bit below, but that sort of cumulatively month after month, more water going out of the bathtub than into it, that builds up to a really big, uh, you know, sort of deficit of, of listing activity, um, which, you know, so there's still a grain of truth here, right? That, that we never got say bounce back listing growth, the way that we saw bounce back sales growth last year. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the mystery. We have surveyed homeowners and asked them, they do cite the pandemic as a reason that they're holding back. Um, Frankly, I would have expected, given that, that, that maybe March would see some major improvement in listing activity this year, but it hasn't happened. Um, it just hasn't happened yet. Um, the Now, we may be in a bit of a vicious cycle where the, one of the most common reasons we hear now that existing homeowners won't list is they're worried about finding their next home. They've, they've heard the news that it's hard to find a home out there. You may get kind of stranded searching for weeks. Um, Personally, I just went through a bit of this myself where I sold my my starter home, my first home, I, and I took several weeks shopping to get my next home. And it's very stressful, you know, finding short term rentals, uh, wor you know, worrying what, you know, what if I keep getting outbid? Uh, those existing homeowners have a point that it's it's a really tricky dance to sell your home and make sure you've got the next one lined up to move into. So that may be holding people back now. Uh, the, the one other point worth mentioning is forbearance. There, there are still millions of homeowners in forbearance, thanks to these programs that keep getting extended. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a fantastic policy, I think, that has helped avoid kicking people out on the street in the middle of the pandemic, most of whom lost their jobs because of effectively, you know, an act of God, what, what happened to the economy. Um, but that, that does mean some of, especially the most motivated sellers or even distressed sales we would expect with this much unemployment, uh, are instead kind of frozen. They're, they're kind of frozen in place. Uh, mm -hmm. That seems to be getting whittled down a little bit over time. And and that's what, and the propensity to keep extending this suggests to me that we're, we're never just going to see a flood of those foreborn homes hit the market. So that I, I think that that's what's going on here is that homeowners are still mostly sitting tight. Um, the, the one other explanation I might point to for for why we haven't seen new listings accelerate is 
I think older folks, you know, who might have thought about selling that home that they've, they've been growing older in, maybe thought about moving into a retirement village or a nursing home, you know, all depends sort of on health considerations. I think a lot of people are putting that off or, or saying that, that, you know what, that's not for me. That, there, there was a lot of really, re, there were a lot of really bad stories of, uh, of, of things going wrong in, in some of those living situations this year. And, and so I think that has changed the zeitgeist and is, is going to, I don't know if it's permanent, but certainly contribute to older homeowners wanting to sit tight for longer. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, you list some of the potential reasons, right? That people may not be listing their home. One of the things I like to look at is buyer sentiment. Fannie Mae has a, has a monthly housing survey and what happened at COVID for many, many months, it's always been, you know, buy the, the uh, buyer sentiment, uh, right time to sell has always been higher than right time to buy and post COVID those inverted. And that is exactly what you're talking about. The sentiment changed on the listing side with many, many buyers. So I don't foresee us really seeing a major shift in, in inventory unless there is a demand shock. And we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. But let's go back to you talk about the drain, the demand out there, you know, the rate of sales, the demand in the market right now. And we're seeing rapid price appreciation. It, are, are all markets the same? Are we seeing this demand in all markets at all price points? Or are we seeing it concentrated in, in areas in different price ranges? Uh, it, it's a pretty broad surge in demand. Prices are rising virtually everywhere in the country. Um, they, uh, with some nuance there, you know, we're based in Seattle here. So in the Seattle region, we can see that price appreciation in the city itself, the city of Seattle is a bit slower than in the suburbs and especially sort of affordable suburbs, as well as Tacoma, which is sort of, you know, uh, a, a sort of a neighboring, you know, up to an hour away, uh, um, kind of satellite city. Uh, so that suggests that a lot of this, this price appreciation is being driven by first time buyers. They're, they're looking for kind of the more affordable parts of the region. San Francisco mm -hmm. has a similar phenomenon right now where the city itself uh, has flat or even declining prices. It, it kind of depends how, what we're looking at while the region as a whole has, has pretty robust price growth. And in particular, Alameda County, the East Bay, mm -hmm. Oakland, um, again, kind of a more traditionally a more affordable slice of the region is seeing really rapid price appreciation. Um, so a lot of this, a lot of that, it, it's a little difficult to disentangle. Is it the locations or the home types? Because what we're really seeing is the most intense demand, pressure and growth in demand for single family homes, typically, you know, bigger than two bedrooms. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what is selling like hotcakes right now. And again, that will, that, plays a big role in that kind of compositional difference of what is different about the homes in San Francisco versus Alameda County or Santa Clara County, you know, the, the suburbs. Um, it, it, it's a different home type. Same with Seattle versus, you know, the rest of King County here. Um, so that that's why I would say there, there's a real core of truth to this idea of the surge in suburban demand. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that that is that that comports with this story of who's driving the demand of the wave of 30 somethings deciding to buy their first home. It, it doesn't necessarily mean cities are dead. No one likes urban life anymore, but more just that the typical move from your last apartment that you're renting to buying your first home for most Americans in most places in America, that's just based on the way our housing stock is built. That's going to look like a move to a detached home. Um, I, I do think, you know, that choice of larger single family home versus condo uh, is definitely getting tilted away from condos right now. It could that could be actually leaving maybe sort of a sweet spot of, of pricing for condos uh, for anyone who's kind of looking forward to the bounce back of, of urban living. Um, but but otherwise, there, there's not a lot of kind of bargains out there. Right. Yeah. And, and we're seeing that as well. You mentioned Alameda County in uh, California, in the Oakland area. We're definitely seeing a strong uh, net in migration and growth in builder business in that corridor going north up into Sacramento. So absolutely, you know, that's where we're seeing it in different parts of the country as well. You know, from my seat, because we're in the finance, you know, when the pandemic hit, we saw uh, 
interest rates hit a generational low level, right? And that was in direct response to the pandemic shutdown. And now in the last 60 days or 90 days, we've seen interest rates come off the bottom. They've come off from two and a half percent up to about three and a quarter, still at a historic level, very, very low, but that's 75 basis points. That's 0.75 rate change has increased people's principal and interest payment around 8%. And mathematically, that's equivalent to about an 8% price increase. But that doesn't accommodate, that doesn't, excuse me, that doesn't account for price appreciation. So if prices have been going up at 10 or 15%, now interest rates have moved and changed the payment. For many buyers in a very short period, their payments have gone up anywhere from 15 to 20%. So, you know, I don't see price appreciation slowing down too much. What is, what is your feeling or what is your forecast around, around interest rates? And also, can you give us a little background on, you know, what are the economic factors that, that drive the interest rates or the mortgage rates today? You know, I, number one, I, I think medium to long-term interest rates, the 10-year treasury, 30-year treasury, 30-year mortgage rates, are best viewed as a barometer of expectations of economic growth. This is, you know, it's like the the wind drag increasing on a car as you're accelerating onto the highway. That's, um, it, it's just gets more expensive to borrow money in, in a context like that. And it, it, it is reflecting in, in a lot of ways, these rising rates are because in that way of looking at them, they're, they're a good thing. You know, they're reflecting the strength of the economy, the strength of the economic forecast here, that, that the economy is roaring back to life. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and we expect that to continue for several quarters at least. Um, but of, of course, this raises borrowing costs. And, it, and it, especially for buyers, this is really going to start pinching affordability, especially in really pricey markets like the West Coast. Mm -hmm. My mind goes right to the West Coast markets first because San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, Seattle, uh, San Diego. These were all places that really had a plateau, a slowdown, kind of a soft patch in demand and price growth, particularly price growth back in late 2018 into 2019 when interest rates also rose. We were seeing them up uh, around or above 4%. Um, again, in the perspective, 30 years of mortgage rates, that sounds like a great bargain. But, you know, uh, with people who, you know, right up there over 40% DTI, uh, that could be make or break for getting into the housing market. So, you know, frankly, our, our outlook is that interest rates are probably going to keep marching up. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the ceiling remains kind of low. There, there's this broad sort of secular trend over the last couple of generations of falling mortgage rates. So I think kind of the, the overall range that they'll move in, even during a strong economic expansion, is relatively low by historic standards. But they've definitely got room to rise. And, and I think they're going to keep marching upwards for the next year. Uh, we'll see where they are in a year, but the, the direction is definitely going upward. What does that do? Yeah, as, as you said, that makes it harder to afford a home. And I really think about these marginal, th these markets where that marginal buyer is right on the cusp of can they afford the monthly mm -hmm. payment based on their interest rate? Not such a big deal in Cincinnati, Kansas City, Minneapolis. Uh, those are places where a, a, a middle class couple going to buy their going to buy their first house. They sure like having a lower mortgage rate, but you know, with with homes, a lot of family sized homes available for three hundred grand, three hundred fifty out there, that payment actually works out to be quite affordable for a large swath of buyers, whether mortgage rates are two and a half or four percent. But uh, that that's not quite the case in Seattle and San Francisco. That's why I, I think these markets are a bit more susceptible in terms of the price appreciation to the interest rate changes. Mm -hmm. The um, I, I think one other thing to keep in mind is that the dynamic could, it could play out as kind of hottest before the plateau because mm -hmm. a lot of buyers out there have this sense of, I, I might miss my chance. I might miss my chance to get an affordable home at the lowest rate possible because rates are rising so quickly. If mm -hmm. it takes me another month to close on a house, Am I going to be paying another half a point higher on interest? If so, if a lot of people have that expectation, they, then it makes sense to be willing to bid at another 10, 20, $50,000 to their escalation clause today 
just to try to take this last chance to lock things in. That goes for first time buyers. The story for existing homeowners is, is a little bit different where I do think they're going to get a little bit more likely to be kind of locked in. They refinanced down to two and a half percent last year. They don't want to do their move up home purchase to their, the, you know, their dream home, their next bigger home at 4%. That just feels like a psychological barrier that, that just feels like getting ripped off at that point. So that could, unfortunately, that could be one more factor that keeps the flow of, of existing home listings kind of depressed. Yeah, well, you're hitting on it. It's buyer sentiment. I mean, buyer sentiment is fickle. And if they feel that things are overpriced, if the news is broadcasting that it will affect buyer behavior, you know, we got to remember pre pandemic interest rates were around 4% and homes were selling. But the move off the bottom is a psychological barrier, right? We've seen it move so much. And what I anticipated as a how payment is no longer there. But when you combine that with rising home prices, it's a it's a double hit to the house payment and affordability and purchasing power. So a question I have, just a general question, wage growth. The only real offset to all of this is wage growth. Are, are we seeing wage growth pick up in markets? I mean, is that going to help us with any offset here or is it just where we're headed? I, I think wage, wage growth has been strong. Disposable personal income has been strong. Frankly, we need another few months of regular economic data where we don't have stimulus payments going out, um, super UI benefits going out to unemployed folks mm -hmm. to get a clear picture of what are the actual wages out there when, you know, if you look at any chart of disposable personal income that and, and year over year change or month over month change, the, the vertical axis has just been broken by what happened last year with stimulus payments. Um, and and a whole whole bunch of sort of peculiarity. So it's actually a little hard to see what the true wage trend will be. I think there's reason for optimism. We have a lot of signals from policymakers of really interest and willingness to run the economy hot. Um, Jerome Powell has been beating the drum of we're not going to take away the punch bowl. Uh, we're not spooked by a little inflation because they, they kind of expect some inflation um, especially making these year over year comparisons now to the pandemic. Um, th they seem pretty determined to uh, keep their foot on the throttle. Same with Congress, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, working hand in hand with the administration. We have every reason to expect that it, it seems like all of the federal policy levers are going into overdrive to try to get some catch up growth. And that's what the forecasts show. I think that will mm -hmm. translate into strong wage growth as well. Yeah, and that's going to help. I mean, the strong wage growth is really what's what's needed um, because as long as we have the combination of price appreciation and rising interest rates or mortgage rates, we're going to be putting a lot of uh, pressure on affordability. And, and speaking of that, you talked about 2018. I want to dig a little deeper back then, or, or, or back there in terms of what, what we saw back in that. And for those who don't who weren't aware of this or in markets who maybe didn't experience this. In 2018, we had 100 basis points, so a 1% change in a 12-month period in mortgage rates. And just I forgot exactly what they changed from, but say 3.5 to 4.5. They did that over a very quick period in terms of also rapid rising price appreciation. And in the third quarter in some of our very expensive markets, we saw a stall. And Jeff, I just want you to talk about that because when I look at what's going on today, I'm wondering, and I'd be interested in your opinion, you know, with rates and pricing going up, do you see, I mean, how can you, can you quantify a potential risk this year or next year of when we may bump into an affordability issue and how that might manifest itself in the market? What would that look like? So I, I think from the, perspective of prices, what we'd expect to see with an affordability ceiling in, in certain markets, mm -hmm. would it would look like a plateau. Um, but, you know, when, when you chart out the, you know, year over year movements, or even maybe seasonally adjusted month over month movements uh, of, of, a, of a price level that had a plat, you know, that climbed and hit a plateau, it looks scary. You know, it, it looks very, very similar to the dynamics of the beginning of a price crash. But if what's holding people back is just the prices are so high, then 
we wouldn't actually expect that to trigger sort of a cycle of falling prices. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other factor that's really important there is whether or not we've got distressed sales. If we have a wave of foreclosures, um, you know, bank owned properties selling at auction, um, that certainly can be part of a, a chain reaction of falling mm -hmm. prices. But given how much equity people have been appreciating, even these millions of homeowners in forbearance have seen their properties skyrocket in value while, you know, while they were pausing on their mortgage payments, there shouldn't, there should be a lot of room. There's a lot of surplus to kind of divvy up and work things out to avoid a foreclosure. Um, so, so that's why I think the risk from distress sales is very, very small. And that, that would be kind of one of the things that turns a plateau into a cycle of falling prices. Um, otherwise, you know, sort of locally speaking, if you have a major employer pulling out or major layoffs, mm -hmm. that, that could certainly cause a, a severe localized drop in demand. Um, but what we saw last time was the most expensive markets were really the ones that hit that plateau, mm -hmm. uh, where, where it kind of flatlined. Homes were still selling, you know, the, the volume of sales was, was still going on, but, but it did drop off substantially. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's probably what we could expect. But again, for the reasons I mentioned about the overall level of affordability, whether you're comparing, you know, sort of na so nationwide, or if you're thinking of localized markets, places that are similar to the nation actually include, you know, Dallas and Houston are two places where the, the typical home value is not far off from, from the national level. Um, in markets like that, home, the, the cost of the mortgage is and for the foreseeable future will remain pretty attractive either compared to people's incomes that you know they mm -hmm. they a large swath of the middle class has no trouble qualifying and it will be an affordable payment for them or compared to their alternative of renting uh it, it still looks really really attractive in those markets so i think it, it, in those places there there's not much risk of kind of that price ceiling coming in from affordability mm -hmm. um the what, what may cause it in a place like Dallas or Houston rather is builders, those are places that, that have been actually accommodating the growth and demand where builders are able to build nearly enough homes, at least in the medium to long term, to keep up with demand. Anytime you have a short term surge in demand, you do see prices. We have seen Dallas getting some real lift off lately, catching some of the national heat. Um, but if you know, if you if our audience here is builders, that's that's still good news for Dallas builders that you know you've got people willing to buy at these prices. Yeah, and I, if I remember back in 2018, especially in the high cost markets, we saw about a 90 day pause. Um, you know, it went from red hot one week to just simply a pause. Buyers did come back. There wasn't massive depreciation or anything going on. You know, some houses pulled back on pricing, but it had a tendency to be the upper end, as you said, transactions that were closing were more in the affordability area, right? So if you were at the higher end, you were your home sat. If you were in the middle of the market, you still had showings and viewings going on. So yeah, you know, we don't know when this will happen. I always get asked that question. Um, you know, we'll know when the doorbell doesn't ring, you know, when nobody's online, nobody's <laughs> nobody's scheduling appointments. You know, you talked about the difference between urban and city demand a little bit. And you and I had talked before and you'd spoke on our program about, you know, how people are searching because COVID has really changed a lot. Now that people were working at home, a lot of companies, while we are going back to work, a lot of companies are still embracing the, you know, work from home. Have you seen changes in search behaviors online with people? Are you seeing people search, you know, if I'm in one market, I'm searching in another market that may maybe is not normal for me to search in. Are you are you seeing those types of behaviors? So I was actually just last night updating some of these uh, some of these dashboards that kind of dig into that, and in particular, mm -hmm. dig into the, the the changes in um, how much people are looking in urban zip codes versus suburban zip codes. Um, and you know, unfortunately, that you know, it's it's sort of a boring story, which is that people are remarkably stable. When we take all that traffic, looking at for sale listings on Zillow, the mm -hmm. share of people looking at urban homes and suburban homes is actually very, very similar to what it was a year ago or two years ago. Um, it, in, in fact, uh, there, there's a slight uptick um, in the traffic going to urban homes or homes mm -hmm. in urban zip codes. Um, it, but it's hard to interpret something like that. 
Could that be maybe apartment renters who are thinking of buying their first home? So they look, they first look, they spend a lot of time looking at maybe detached homes, but they're in the city limits. Uh, Seattle is full of neighborhoods that, you know, are tree lined detached single family homes that still due to the, the overall density get classified by us as, as urban. Um, so that could still be kind of interest transmuting from truly sort of dense urban rentals into single family homes. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, we, we don't know down to, you know, the, the, the address of, of where everyone's kind of looking from. We, we can kind of say from the Seattle region, there's really strong, still really strong and even slightly growing interest in uh, so-called urban zip codes. So, um, you know, Base, yeah, my, my big takeaway from that is is the date the data doesn't support some sort of everyone's given up on the city, everyone's moving out. <laughs> if you're looking for that in the data, it's not there. Yeah, well, the traffic doesn't suggest that either, um, especially when you're driving into the cities uh, today. Okay, Jeff, this is this is this is the the speed round here in terms of looking forward twenty the rest of 2021 and 2022. I'm going to ask you four different areas. Give me your thoughts and projections on what's what we're going to see. Let's first start with inventory. What does it look like going forward this year and next year? It's going to keep declining. We have a seasonal, there is a seasonal trend upwards starting in March and April. I think, so I think, you know, raw, not adjusted, we will see more homes on the market in May than we did in February for sure. But the comparison to a year ago is just going to be an even deeper inventory deficit, I think, for the next several months. I don't know what is going to pull us out of that. Um, for, for now, all the factors are pointing to an even deeper inventory shortage. Okay, on that happy note, uh, pricing appreciate, price appreciation, where do we see uh, what, when you guys are looking at price appreciation for this year and for next year, where do we, where do we see that going? We think price, we think year over year price appreciation is going to top out this fall, maybe in September or October, mm -hmm. over 12, maybe 14% annual appreciation sort of nationwide. I think it will start to trend down that, that annual appreciation down to maybe around 10% higher next February compared to this February. Mm -hmm. um, but we were just talking about, you know, this February data was so much higher, about 10%, you know, about 10% higher than a year ago. So now we're stacked. That is now not just one easy comparison, but stacking 10% on top of last year's 10% growth. Oh, I, I, I think the sticker price for homes is just going to be a lot higher. I think a lot of people are already looking around and saying, this is outrageous. These prices are outrageous. It can't go on. I, I think it can. I think there's a lot of gas left in the tank for price appreciation. Okay, and you mentioned uh, interest rates. Interest rates. You're forecasting, you know, uh, upward movement. There's a lot of upward pressure on that as well. Where do you guys think interest rates will be? You know, later this year or next year? Do you do you, I, do you actually come up with a number or a range? I, I, I can't share a particular point estimate point. Um, okay. I, I, I think a range of, you know, I, I think a range of around three and three quarters to 4% is well within the range of possibility. Yeah. And I would agree with you because that's where we were pre COVID. And uh, as you talked about interest rates being a reflection of the health of the economy and demand and inflation out there, that would be a reasonable uh, expectation on mine as well, unless inflation is, you know, off the chart. Um, but, you know, we don't expect that. Uh, we do expect some inflation, but we don't expect it to be, you know, at a level of which would push interest rates significantly higher. But who knows? You never know uh, in our world. And let's end with this. In terms of just buyer sentiment, buyer demand, um, are buyers getting fatigued? Do we see them thin over the next... Uh, you know, 18 months, what are you seeing for demand? I think buyers are getting fatigued, uh, but I, I think that is transmuting into getting creative. You know, they, they look around, they can, they conclude, you know what, I can't afford this Seattle neighborhood. I was, you know, where I've been renting, where the first place I looked, I'm, I, I'm going to look further out. I'm going to consider Tacoma. You know, I'm, I, I think buyers are getting creative, but 
you know, for somebody who's got that second kid on their way and, you know, in their mid thirties, they're not just buying a house because they think the prices sound nice because it sounds like, or because they think it's a good investment. They're buying a house because they need a bigger place to live. And, uh, you know, if, if that second kid is on the way, they can't just wait until the market cools down. They, they've got to find one somewhere. So I, I, I think the buyers will keep coming and, you know, they're, they're going to get creative. They may start sort of, you know, avoiding some of these most expensive places. Um, but there are a lot of places in America, even a lot of places in the periphery of expensive places, uh, a lot of neighborhoods where they'll still be able to find homes they can afford and, and they're going to go out, offer and close on them. Well, that's great news. And Jeff, uh, first of all, thank you for being on our program. You had some great insight uh, about the market, about potential risks. And for all of our listeners, I hope you found this uh, very beneficial. I'm, I'm feeling very good about the next 18 months. You know, definitely there's going to be some turbulence around affordability, but clearly we don't have the risks we had back in 08 and 09 in our market. And for most of us, uh, business still will be good and our buyers will be able to purchase homes. So thank you, Jeff, for being on today. And for all of us here at the Sales Lab, thank you for listening and have a great day.